This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Thursday, February 27th. This is Africa 54. The growing spread of the coronavirus rattles worldwide stock markets as health officials scramble to slow its advance. Human rights groups claim Kenyan police have shot and killed over 100 mostly young poor men under suspicious circumstances. The United Nations is now investigating. And is the love of chocolate bad for the environment? We'll explain how Africa's cocoa producing countries can sustainably grow the crop. Fear of a global coronavirus pandemic has health officials worldwide focused on what measures they can take to stop the spread of the respiratory flu-like disease that has infected at least 82,000 people in more than 40 countries. The United States has issued a new travel warning advising its citizens to avoid going to South Korea, which has reported over 1,700 cases of COVID-19, the most outside of China. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison says his country has initiated emergency measures to restrain the spread of the virus, where 23 confirmed cases have been reported. So while the WHO is yet to declare uh, the nature of the uh, coronavirus and its move towards a pandemic phase, um, we believe that the risk of a global pandemic is very much upon us and as a result, uh, as a government, uh, we need to take the steps necessary to prepare for such a pandemic. And so earlier today, I instructed through the NSC, the Minister for Health, uh, to be engaging with the state and territory ministers uh, to be bringing back the plan to identify any gaps uh, in capabilities at the various stages or levels at which a pandemic may proceed to. The spread of the coronavirus outbreak also prompted U.S. and South Korean military officials to indefinitely postpone a series of joint military exercises until further notice. The announcement comes after the U.S. military announced its first infection of an American service member with COVID-19. At least 20 South Korean soldiers have also been infected and thousands more placed under quarantine on South Korean military bases. Now, World Health Organization Chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus says governments need to remain vigilant even if they see a reduction in cases. Denmark reported its first case Thursday involving a man who returned from a trip to Italy that followed the first reported case in Brazil, the first in Latin America, also involving someone who had been in Italy. Other countries to join the list of those with confirmed cases are Romania, Greece, Norway and Pakistan. We'll have more on the global economic effects of the coronavirus later in our broadcast. Now to East Africa, where Kenya, for the first time, has allowed the informal visit of a United Nations envoy on extrajudicial and summary executions. Agnès Calamard, a French human rights expert, met with relatives of police killings in Nairobi, where hundreds of cases have left relatives and friends of victims feeling powerless. Rylan Boer reports. 60-year-old Effa Kwendo lost two of her eight children in 2018, just months apart, when police in broad daylight shot them dead. She admits her sons got into some trouble, but says nothing would warrant the use of lethal force. Robert, Robert had never been arrested or taken to jail. No one ever called to tell me he had been arrested or taken someone's car. All I know is my son had a temper. If you wronged him, he would beat you up. Even my second son, there was nothing major he had done. Maybe getting into little fights here and there. The deaths are just two of hundreds of cases of police killings that Kenyan rights groups have documented. This month, a coalition of Kenyan rights groups reported police last year alone killed 107 people, most of them young poor men shot to death in slums under suspicious circumstances. When we stop recognizing these, these deaths, these extrajudicial killings, 
When we say that nothing is changing and therefore we will not document it, we acquiesce to these killings. Rights group accused Kenya's independent police oversight authority of not doing enough to stop the killings. The independent police oversight authority says 142 cases from last year are under investigation, but admits only six have been sent to the public prosecutor, who says few witnesses are willing to come forward. We have community outreach and we are reaching out to a lot of these communities who are being affected by this problem uh, and trying to sensitize them. Uh, and trying to ask, uh, to ask them to be more bold in terms of giving us the evidence. Uh, we are trying to uh, uh, make them uh, understand their rights uh, to, uh, to access uh, justice and how they can do that. Kenya this month for the first time allowed the informal visit of the UN's envoy on extrajudicial summary and arbitrary executions, Agnes Kalamad. She met relatives of police victims in Nairobi and Mombasa and called on Kenyan authorities to do more. When after this killing there is no investigation, there is no prosecution, and there is no justice, that's a second killing. And that killing is a killing of our society. Impunity kills our society. Relatives of victims hope that the UN envoy's visit will help start the wheels of justice. Meanwhile, Kenyan activists say they'll continue documenting and publishing police killings until they no longer have to. Raya Lombor for VOA News, Nairobi. East African countries are racing against time to prevent new swarms of locusts from wreaking havoc with crops and livelihoods after the worst infestation in generations. The plague is now threatening food security for millions of people. David Dio has more. In northern Kenya, the next generation of locusts has already been born. But as the plague multiplies and spreads across East Africa and the Horn of Africa, governments hit by violence or a lack of supplies are struggling to hold back the tide. In a region where 19 million people already go hungry, the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization representative to Kenya, Dr. Tobias Takavarasha, says it's a disaster that eclipses all others. It is a big threat. It is the biggest threat. Much as we say drought is a threat, much as we say that floods can be a threat, but if you are trying to rank them, I think uh, they're all threat, but desert local situation is an unprecedented threat on food security. A single square kilometer swarm can eat as much food in a day as 35,000 people. And the FAO warned last month that, left unchecked, the number of locusts in East Africa could explode by 500 times by June. When eggs hatch, as they have been doing recently in Kenya's Archer's Post, the young locusts, or hoppers, are earthbound for two weeks and are more vulnerable to spraying. But this month, Kenya, the region's wealthiest and most stable country, ran out of pesticide for about a week and a half, leaving residents and farmers to watch helplessly as the crops they count on to feed their families were devoured. It's disturbing because we've never seen anything like this. And also when they land on vegetation, they eat everything, even the grass. If this continues, they will eat all the vegetation. In neighboring Uganda, the military has been deployed, hand spraying trees in the morning before locusts take flight. Somalia, where the infestation was first reported in December, can't provide security to exterminators. Ethiopia needs 500,000 litres of pesticide for the upcoming harvest and planting season. But the country's single pesticide factory is struggling to produce its maximum 200,000 litres as foreign exchange shortages have delayed the purchase of chemicals. The pesticides are available, but the pesticides require financial resources before they can be released. The FAO has put together an appeal for funds, initially estimated at 67 million US dollars and later increased to 135 million dollars. So far, 22 million has been donated. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. Ethiopian officials are not attending a final round of US brokered talks with Egypt and Sudan to resolve a dispute about its giant hydroelectric dam project on the Nile River. 
The three nations had announced last month that they would sign an agreement to end their differences over the filling and operation of the $4 billion Grand Ethiopian Dam located near Ethiopia's border with Sudan. The last round of talks are being held in Washington Thursday and Friday. But a spokesman for Ethiopia's water ministry says it did not send a delegation because it was still engaged in consultations. The dispute over what will be Africa's largest hydroelectric dam pits Ethiopia's desire to pull millions out of poverty against Egypt's concern over a critical water supply. Cocoa is a critical cash crop for West African farmers, many of whom own just a few acres of land according to Worldwide Fund for Nature. However, the plant's production is also a major cause of deforestation as cocoa farmers usually clear tropical forests to plant new cocoa trees rather than reusing the same land. Africa 54 managing editor Vincent McCory spoke with Timothy Pearson, a carbon specialist who directs the Ecosystem Services Unit at Winrock International about how cocoa can be sustainably grown. Giving tenure to the local people, having programs in place as the government in Ghana has for certain, and I'm sure governments all around the world have, to start to give people the rights to lands that they have been managing for many years is, is in, in everyone's interest, really. Many people will tell you that uh, if you go across Ghana and Ivory Coast and uh, so many of the African countries where this cocoa grows, most locals don't even eat chocolate. Uh, no. So many locals don't even come close to affording chocolate. The pressure to produce comes from the West, from oh. this mega, you know, multinationals. So who is the problem here? Is it the local farmers? or it is the multinational companies. It definitely has to come from the consumers and from the multinational companies to put pressure on to try and say, we want chocolate to be sustainable. We want chocolate to be a positive part of the environment. And so you're starting to see this, the pressure from the people leads to some of the big multinationals starting to make pledges, Olam and Hershey's and Mars and Barry Calibo, starting to say, we're only looking for our chocolate to be deforestation free chocolate. And that's supposed to happen over the next four or five years, moving in that but direction. But is there motivation? You see, uh, a farmer in Ivory Coast may make three to five dollars a day from the cocoa produce. Uh, but uh, the multinationals are making billions of dollars and their interest, of course, is to make as much money as they can. How will they be incentivized to take any action so that they can share the profits uh, with the local farmers? <laughs> I mean, th this comes in many levels. You definitely have the high-tier chocolate, where you can have organic chocolate, or you can have uh, Rainforest Alliance certified chocolate, where suddenly there should be a premium for the, for the pods and the beans that are bought. And the, that premium, in theory, moves on to the farmers. But uh, on another level, the public pressure leads to the mass producers requiring that the chocolate be uh, sustainable and produced in a sustainable manner, and therefore, Market pressures means that some of that has to come through to the people. Yeah. The argument here is that if farmers could be getting more from their chocolate, from their cocoa plants, if they could get more money passed down to them, most of these problems would be resolved. It's not that they wouldn't be able to take care of the environment. They have been growing cocoa for many, many years, but the farmers are not getting the profit. And the multinationals don't really have that interest other than making big money. So how do you address it? It's a complex and certainly a thorny issue, but I think having as much visibility as possible on both sides, having visibility on what the bad things can be, what the poor practices can be, what the negative sides can be. In fact, some of the farmers know that what they're doing perhaps is not as helpful. Even uh, they, they may wish to do things differently, but when you have a, just a handful of big companies from Europe, from the West, controlling this industry and focusing razor sharp on profit. What options does the farmer have, really? In the past, we may have had multinationals that said, you know, we're only the secondary buyers. We're not working directly with the farmers, so we shouldn't be responsible. And I, th I think the pressure is now to understand that the responsibility does, to a significant extent, rest with them. And they need to think about sustainably sourcing and whatever is involved in sustainably sourcing, which hopefully ideally is going to be giving power to the local farmers and giving them the, the financial resources they need.
That was Timothy Pearson, a carbon specialist at Winrock International, speaking with Africa 54 managing editor Benson McCory. And we'll be right back. In other news, Greek islanders are striking Thursday as part of ongoing opposition to new migrant reception centers to be built on the islands. Protests are being held at central points on Lesbos, Chios and Samos before a planned meeting between the government and local mayors. On Lesbos, the two days of clashes between protesters and police officers brought in to guard construction workers on the site where the new centers are to be built. The new facility will replace overcrowded camps and will receive migrants arriving to the islands and determine their status. Migrants from the camps are being transferred to the mainland. Residents say existing camps have become a prison for both residents and migrants, and building new camps will only amplify the problems. February is African American History Month in the United States, a time to recall and celebrate the accomplishments and contributions made by people of African descent. But not many know this annual U.S. tradition was born here in Washington, D.C. VOA's Chris Simpkins introduces us to the man who started it and the home where people are learning about his legacy. And this would have been Dr. Woodson's library. John Fowler guides tourists through the home of Carter G. Woodson. The historic landmark in the nation's capital is dedicated to the man who founded Black History Month here 94 years ago. Dr. Uh, Carter G. Woodson was a man with purpose. He was a man who set out to uh, help his people by uncovering a lot of the truth that seemingly was kept from uh, his people. Fighting against discrimination and efforts to erase black history, Woodson, a historian and teacher, launched an organization whose sole mission was documenting black life, history, and culture. And Dr. Woodson felt that if he could somehow influence um, the masses by revealing this history, this historical truth, that African Americans, people of African descent, were more than just slavery, uh, were more than just uh, the negative stereotypes. He believed that perhaps racism, segregation, could be abolished. In addition to compiling and disseminating census data on America's black population, Woodson collected and preserved manuscripts from African American writers like Booker T. Washington. These works were later published in the Journal of Negro History. Hello. Welcome. Welcome, young man, to 1538 Ninth Street, my home. Actor Dexter Hamlet portrays Woodson for visitors to the home. I want folks to walk through this exhibit and feel the energy of Dr. Woodson. And on their exit, I want to share a bit of the humanity of this home his life and history with them. Dr. Woodson's spirit and all those who worked in here with him still resides here. Barbara Dunn works for the organization Woodson founded in 1915, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. From 1922 when he purchased this home until 1950 when he died in this home, Dr. Woodson was wise enough 
to actually publish because he knew people would not publish what he was writing. He started his own publishing company right in this home. Woodson's house was also a gathering place for future leaders in a segregated city where blacks could not freely congregate. This home is where Dr. Woodson would have trained and mentored a lot of the leading scholars and activists and historians. Dr. Woodson wanted this home to be just a, a cultural center and he achieved that. Julia Goodman Gaffney, a high school history teacher, says visiting the home inspires her. I try to share that with my students, you know, we, we took the month to celebrate what we learned, not just to learn. You know, this is supposed to be the celebration. To make absolutely certain that Negro history is elevated to a respectable field of study and becomes a source of pride and inspiration for future generations. Carter Woodson's Thank legacy and his home remains a treasure of African American history. Thank you. Chris Thank Simpkins, you. VOA News, Washington. Thank you. It has been almost three years since Saudi Arabia and other Sunni majority nations started a land and air blockade against the tiny oil producing Gulf nation of Qatar, accusing it of supporting groups including the Muslim Brotherhood and for its ties to Iran. Yet, rather than suffering damage, Qatar's economy has diversified and the World Bank says it is growing faster than Saudi Arabia's. Jacob Watschafter reports from Daha. A massive cow lift organized by businessman Muataz Al Hayat came quickly in response to the embargo. Within 18 months, thousands of dairy cows were brought into Qatar by air and by sea. When the blockade happened in 2017, we took that decision to ship the 4,000 cows from the United States directly, and we built the phase one of our project to provide the country the milk needed here. Now this farm produces 500 tons of milk and cheese per month, and it's even begun exporting to Oman, one of the two Gulf states that did not join the embargo. The embargo is also transforming Qatar's landscape. More of this desert land is now being used for agriculture. And we are planning to increase the production to four to five million square meter in the coming two, three years. This is the food security for the food and vegetable. And this is our aim, and this is our intention to do that. I think if we get the full support within three, four years, we can have almost 80% of our requirement to be produced locally, especially in the vegetable. A harsh climate, sandy soil, and little water mean reaching this goal has to happen in hydroponic greenhouses. We uh, produce four, four main crops, uh, zucchini, tomato, eggplant, and, uh, and uh, tomato, beside mushroom, of course. They're all organic. With the cows and cutting edge farming, the embargo has brought more economic self-reliance. Its growing stock exchange now lists more companies that produce for the local market. The Baladna Group recently started trading publicly and demand for its shares exceeded supply on opening day. For some, Qatari self-sufficiency means security and a sense of relief. It's better to feel independent when you have uh, your own product at your country and you feel more safe and you don't need others. And so an embargo that was meant to weaken Qatar appears to be having an opposite effect. Jacob Warchafter for VOA News, Doha. Now, the growing spread of the coronavirus is rattling stock markets with global indexes experiencing sharp losses Thursday. Authorities in China and other hard-hit countries are enforcing lockdowns that are paralyzing production, interrupting supply chains and disrupting tourism and other key service sectors. VOA's Adita Dunelari examines risks to the global economy if the coronavirus becomes a pandemic. Stock markets from the United States to Asia and Europe have been hit hard as health authorities confirm new pockets of coronavirus infection from the Middle East to Europe. The market is now coming to recognize that this epidemic has far from peaked. It now looks like it's spreading 
and it's going to be causing a lot of disruptions to global supply chains, to the travel industry, to tourism, to a whole lot of things. Coronavirus has triggered widespread fear and increasingly severe reactions from authorities in scores of countries, imposing lockdowns with paralyzing effects on commerce, especially in China, the world's second largest economy. What we have in China is a situation where 150 million people are locked down. You know, so these people who went home for the vacation, for the New Year vacation, they now can't return to work. As companies feel the impact, so too will consumers. We're going to see real economic impacts from this outbreak. We've already seen it, for example, when Apple says that there's going to be a palpable impact on its ability to produce iPhones in the near term. Some believe the economic impact will be intense but short-lived. Analyst Mark Hamrick likens coronavirus to a hurricane. Once it passes, recovery begins and activity gradually returns to normal. For investors who are only focused on the short term, uh, these are very real impacts for investors uh, who are focused on the intermediate and long terms. They're going to look beyond this and say, uh, we will live to invest and fight another day. But researcher Desmond Lohmann believes the impact on China will be more long lasting, with companies looking to diversify their supply chains so they can be less reliant on China in the future. Companies will draw lessons from this experience. You know, my expectation is. Uh, that this will be a, a drain on the Chinese economy long term. It's not going to look that attractive for foreign investment. Coronavirus won't be the last economically disruptive pathogen to spread across borders and continents. The question, analysts say, is what lessons nations and companies draw from the outbreak and whether the global economy becomes more resilient to future shocks. Ardita Dunelari. VOA News, Washington. Thank you, Adita. And that wraps up our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening. Let's go.